Keith Livingston here with Healthy Intelligent Training. What I'll talk about today is the development of your cardiovascular machinery, the pumping chamber of your heart. A lot of people are under the illusion that your heart develops most with high intensity. That's only one tiny part of the development. What really develops the heart is the ability to pump consistently at a lower aerobic level where the heart can fully fill its filling chamber, the, the left atrium, the filling chamber of the heart, with freshly oxygenated blood from the lungs. And then that will fill the ventricle, the pumping chamber, and stretch it to the maximum. If there's enough blood going or filling slowly, there's a stretch effect on the muscles that make up the ventricular wall the cardiomyocytes they're called. Now these are actually slow twitch muscle fibers by physiology. They have to be because they go nonstop every day of your life. Since you were two weeks old, your heart's been going. Two weeks old it started. When you were about two weeks old, the heart rate would have been way up there, about 120 to 160 maybe. Um, when you were an infant, of course, it slowed down to a resting pulse quite a lot lower than that. Your average athlete has a resting pulse rate below the average um, because their heart is usually bigger and more effective and got that, that really nicely developed pumping chamber, the left ventricle. Now, this is the chamber that delivers the bulk or all of the fresh oxygenated blood out to the body. Very important to develop a very strong left ventricle or, or large left ventricle, um, because that's your capacity to pump. So you're trying to increase your pumping capacity, not unlike a car engine, the, uh, the CC, how much um, capacity you have to pump blood out to the body, full of oxygen and nutrients and fuel, that determines your performance capacity. Okay, so I'll explain it a bit more by sharing a slide. You can see here, this is a representation of your heart. Anatomically, it's not quite like this, but it'll give you a good idea of what we're talking about. Blood from the body, from the upper arms, from the legs is represented here, going into venous capillaries, into veins, into what's called the ascending vena cava or the lower vena cava, or the inferior vena cava, and then the superior vena cava, which both spill into this right side of the, of the um, heart as we're looking at a person. And then from there it spills into the, it does, it just spills into this pumping chamber here called the right ventricle. And then it gets pumped out with the deoxygenated blood, which is actually carbon dioxide rich, oxygen poor. It gets pumped into the lungs, but in reality, it's, it's two lobes of the lungs, not, not one. Uh, but this is just to represent what happens. And then it gets, the carbon dioxide gets exchanged for oxygen and, and then carbon dioxide's breathed off, oxygen's breathed in, and the oxygen rich blood gets delivered by the pulmonary veins, and there are four of them, two for each side of the left filling chamber of the heart, the left atrium. Fill this chamber and then spill into the left ventricle. Now this is the pumping chamber of the heart, very important. This will grow in its capacity over a training lifetime quite significantly. And we'll talk about that shortly. This is the Burbock study. And this is a study of 1,500 endurance athletes from the junior to high performance area done by Alicia Burbock, who's a physiologist. Uh, this was done in about 1997. And it shows quite significantly how aerobic volume of training, no, no high intensity training with these ones, almost has a linear relationship to actual cardiac volume or how much capacity is in that left ventricle. 
so you can see how as the training hours per week increase, there's a direct correlation with average measured capacity. In fact, the highest level reached in this study looks like it's about probably about 35 milligrams per kilogram volume. And that's done with about 20 hours of, um, well, just under 20 hours of training a week. This was done with an echocardiogram. Now, an echocardiogram is the, um, the standard to measure cardiac volume and pumping capacity in hospitals. So it's a pretty accurate study. This is Alan Cousins. He's an exercise physiologist who's based in Boulder, Colorado. He decided to use low intensity training in the correct aerobic zones as a means of increasing the oxygen carrying capacity or the VO2 max of a uh, highly competitive but not very talented initially um, Ironman or would be Ironman athlete, despite training with high intensity intervals three to five times a week for a few years, uh, was going nowhere but trained like an absolute professional. And, uh, and this poor fellow's measured VO2 max um, was only 53.1. Now that's not bad if you want to be a you know a weekend warrior. You'll be able to complete a an Ironman or a triathlon with a, but it's not nearly enough to make you comfortable at elite levels. So what Alan decided to do, he made, uh, he borrowed the guy's tra training diaries for two years and he graphed what he thought were the intensities being used in training. And, and he, he came to the conclusion that if he just reversed this tendency, he just wanted to see if he could show a significant increase in oxygen uptake and he did. In the first year, this reading went from 53.1 to 64.9. And then he continued for another year. And the capacity of the pumping chamber of the heart with this athlete increased again, increasing the oxygen carrying capacity or delivery capacity of the body. And then in the third year, he introduced just a little bit of um, high intensity training just to top off the VO2 max because VO2 max is really anaerobic. And so it's got an anaerobic topping sitting on top of a, a truly aerobic base. Just like the top of a pyramid, the bigger the base, the higher the peak. You've got this athlete up to a, an elite level over three years and he did it with low intensity training. True story. What is the best intensity to develop your cardiovascular pump? Now, this is the heart rate reserve. This is a very accurate way of measuring what intensity you're training at. That's the difference between your resting pulse rate, which is obviously not zero, it'll be a number, but obviously it's zero percent of intensity because Anything below that just occupied of keeping your whole body physiology alive, everything going. Anything above that, as you start to exercise, as you go through different places from, say, walking to jogging to uh, a light jog, you might reach uh, a point around 50% of intensity in terms of whatever that is in heart rate. It might be for a fit athlete, a heart rate of 120 might be that. You keep going up and then the um, aerobic enzymes um, in the mitochondria of the slow twitch muscle fibers, they get uh, developed in an intensity very similar to the same intensity that develops your left ventricle. As the heart rate goes up, the heart starts to get inefficient as a pump. And you can see this because instead of going up in a straight line related straight to you know, the intensity, as the intensity goes up, the heart rate levels off. So you can see that the effort level by what Arthur Lydia used to give people, that develops your left ventricle cardiac capacity the most, is actually quite comfortable between just steady state and 
what we call half effort. So it's below the level where you're starting to um, move along a bit faster. And it's well, well below um, the anaerobic threshold where you're huffing and puffing. That This is heavy breathing up here. So we, we stay well below that. If you're wondering about high intensity intermittent stimulus to the um, release of growth factor in the blood vessels, this study was done in, uh, or published in 2013. And the outcome was that intense intermittent exercise provided a weak, a weak stimulus for vascular endothelial growth factor secretion and capillary growth in muscle, skeletal muscle. Reasons for this could be simply acidosis. The buildup of acid in the body is not good for health. It's not good for hormonal function. It's not good for anything in particular, but this is what you'll get with high intensity training. You'll get a probably a real stimulus to growth hormone for a little while, but it all has to be recovered from. So in a nutshell, what you're looking for is an intensity that's moderate, that's comfortable, that allows your heart chamber, your pumping chamber, the left ventricle to first of all fill efficiently and have the maximum stretch reflex. It's called, it's called the Frank Starling reflex. It's a stretch mechanism. It's got, it's got those cardiomyocytes have got to be fully extended or stretched by, you know, to the capacity by being full of blood to the capacity of that ventricle. So it's got to be fully filled and that can only happen at a low enough heart rate for enough blood to be delivered and then fill the, the ventricle. So that's it in a nutshell. And that occurs at a steady effort, what we call steady aerobic running. That increases your the bulk of your oxygen carrying capacity. So if you want to increase your VO2 max, you don't train at VO2 max intensity, which is very anaerobic, hard on the body, creates a lot of acidosis and acid is bad news okay see ya